where the, the dampers in the low tenor area are um, all, uh, already very, very small. It can uh, force to make them smaller, but that's not a typical grand piano uh, problem. And um, so that is not uh, normally not a, a huge problem. The effect on the not straight hammer line when you hang the hammers in, in a bow, we have the right man just coming in. Uh, so uh, David Stanwood uh, will just uh, feel, uh, feel his, his uh, hairs going up uh, as, as it has a massive effect on the, on, the, um, on the geometry of the action and on the weight of the hammers and of the uh, effect on the playability of, of it. And so that's more reasons to avoid these things. No, go out. <laughs> Crown and down bearing. Um, first of all, I often come across that uh, the crown is uh, has something to do with the down bearing, but it has not at all. The, um, the crown uh, is just necessary in the soundboard to transport the tension from the highest point of the bridge uh, to the sides of the soundboard and to have a, um, a flexible and functioning uh, soundboard. It has nothing to do with the down bearing that we need uh, for of the strings to press on uh, the on the soundboard and to give load on the soundboard and uh, to transfer the energy of the soundboard. But I think that it's just uh, we just uh, okay. Um, yeah, I think that, that it's just in the wrong order. <laughs> but, but this is uh, still a, a very important uh, thing. We talked about the different types of deformation in the, in the soundboard that uh, cause trouble. And to make it easier, I have here the shape of, a, of an uh, upright piano soundboard. And... Um, Looking at the different um, structure, if you look across the crane of the soundboard, the shrinking of the wood uh, at a change of humidity from 30 to 70 um, percent of humidity, it's not a, a shrinking, it's a growing in this direction, um, is 15 to 17 millimeters that is uh, uh, um, more than half an inch. Yeah? And that's, that's a lot. And if we look at, um, at the other direction, along the grain and along the bridge, the sh uh, shrinking and growing at the same time uh, in this direction is only 1 to 1.2 millimeters. And that uh, shows another very, very important uh, component of the crowning of the soundboard. Because if a soundboard is not only crowned across the crane where it is easily crowned by using ribs and bending ribs, um, but also along the crane uh, where it's much more complicated to create a crowning and, and uh, compression into the soundboard, as the soundboard is also extremely rigid in this direction. But this is a crown that lasts for a century. And the crowning across the crane is gone with the weather. And that is uh, one reason for some instruments remain playable and have a good sound all over the year. And some are only sounding well in summer and, um, and completely down in winter when it is dry. And this is a, a very, very important thing and maybe a very good reason to install a humidifier or something.
downbearing. Um, downbearing is is quite important and um, very often done too much. Um, we need a certain downbearing pressure uh, that is about one to two percent of the string tension. So in in the middle, it is about six to 15 Newton, uh, which is uh, 0.6 to 1.5 kilo, but better uh, for you one to three um, pound per string that the string needs to press on the bridge. Why, why is this needed? Um, if the, the um, string is not pressed to the bridge, uh, the travel of the energy from the bridge, uh, from the string into the bridge is not perfect. So we need a certain amount. If we are at this amount that is uh, enough, and it is already enough at the lower end of it, uh, as the, the bridge is additionally um, hold by the, um, by the uh, delay of the, around the pins, uh, but it needs this pressure on the bridge to transform the energy from the string into the bridge. And this is very important. The second detail in this down bearing is that the sound is coming from the, from the speaking length of the string. And so it is, if, if it is made perfectly, you have two thirds of the load on the front area of the bridge and only one third of the load in the back area which is to secure the good contact of the string all over the length of the string. And um, this is uh, the perfect way to get it. Not always very easy because if you measure it in the situation you have no strings on it, the situation might, might change very much if there is load on as the soundboard is not going down uh, at the complete same um, um, dimension uh, in each area. And you never know before, you only know each, each soundboard is a little individual with this. Yeah, we had this um, situation with uh, normal down bearing and you have to, to make the angle into the uh, bridge to have this stronger load in front and the lower load behind. But um, if you are traveling to the highest travel, if you are uh, having the bridge uh, lower in the back end than in the front, the pressure in the front is too much as the angle of the short um, sounding speaking length is, is too high and the long uh, hitch um, length of the string um, is, uh, is not creating any angle anymore. So in the, in the um, highest treble, in the, uh, normally you have to, to, bear, uh, to, to make the bridge looking a little downwards uh, to, the, uh, to the speaking length, not to have too much um, tension on the front. Calculating the down bearing. Um, if, we, if we look at a calculation, Um, you can see that, uh, um, that the measurements you need to do that uh, are really, really small. And in reality, we put uh, a little more down bearing on the instruments than we really need, because we want to be sure that the down bearing is not zero in the winter when the instrument is dry or if some minor changes take part. But it is very important not to have too much. 
So uh, there's also a huge difference if you string a new instrument where the soundboard never has been under load, or if you restring an old piano where a uh, hundred years have had um, been pressure from the strings on the soundboard. And if you, if you measure the down bearing in the instrument before you take off the strings, and you measure it immediately again after taking off the strings. And then again, after a week without strings, you will see the amazing difference how the soundboard came up when the load has been taken off the soundboard. And that is the, the very uh, important thing uh, that we don't overcharge the the soundboard and in reality in an old uh, instrument we normally um, have to put about half a millimeter uh, of of um, down bearing in the uh, in the treble bridge and and uh, in the center of the bridge where in the center of the soundboard there is the highest uh, down bearing you have to have because the soundboard is moving most in the center of the soundboard. It is not at the tenor end where you need more um, down bearing uh, than, than somewhere else. In the tenor, you need nearly need half a millimeter or something. And uh, in, a, in a bass bridge, very often it is enough if you nearly have nothing little more than nothing in the in the lower end of the base bridge and maybe half a millimeter or maximum a millimeter in the in the um, upper end of the base bridge because you have to see the structure of the soundboard the the long bridge is in the middle and the base bridge a little more in the side and if you put too much load on the base bridge it will drag away the soundboard and, and drag down the uh, long bridge. And, and this is very often a problem. Uh, people do their, their down bearing and then they put on the strings and then they look uh, uh, how the down bearing is after they put the strings and they see in the tenor or in the middle layer, I have no down bearing anymore. And they put more down bearing in this area to have again uh, a result but that was the false end of this row it was just the down bearing is no more existing in the tenor as the down bearing on the bass was too high and the bass is pressing away the soundboard under the the tenor bridge and this is really a, a big uh, problem in many many pianos that there is much too much down bearing in, in, the, in the bridges and um, especially in, in this, this area. Um, you can also see that in a piano that has a very good structure in the, in the travel and mid area, that if you put load on this area and you have, um, you have only a, a very tiny, um, down bearing in the, in the lower middle and tenor area, that this area is even coming up as uh, the strong force from the very strong and, and heavy bent uh, treble and, and lower treble area is pressed, is compressed into this area. And so this is a very, very important thing, but um, um, the main thing is if we make too much uh, down bearing, especially in rebuilding, uh, we suppress the tone and the tonal capacity of the instrument. And uh, there are only very rare cases where the instrument does not sound well because there is not enough of uh, down bearing. Uh, of course it is, but, but most time then the, the soundboard is anyway um, bent to the wrong direction and that's rather the end of the story and um, and not so much as there is not enough um, pressure on the soundboard.
We okay? Yeah. <laughs> do we, uh, <clears throat> before we move on, do we have any questions uh, regarding what we've talked about so far? Okay, let's uh, proceed. Good. Um, the, the action placement um, is also very important. Um, okay. Um, in most pianos, we have differences in the string heights and the positions of the uh, bridges and of the capodasta and all this. And so we have to adjust the position of the action to the actual uh, string position. And, but we have to be very careful how we do this. Um, the first thing is the position in and out of the instrument. And um, the best way to do it is uh, to move uh, the whole action into or out of the piano and just follow with the front uh, cabinet rail uh, with the action in and out. As um, no. We already talked about this. And this is important that we go in and out with the whole action, uh, deeper into the piano or out again. And we don't change anything in relation of the hammer and action contact to the keyboard. And no, we have no change with all this. And if you have looked at this uh, spot, uh, the front rail is going with uh, with the action into the cabinet or a little out again. And normally it is of no interest if your front rail is, uh, front rail is uh, two or five millimeters into the cabinet. Um, it, it makes no difference. Uh, the customer will not uh, uh, realize this. And uh, this is the, the easiest way to, to, have, the, to have this adapted without changing uh, the length of the hammer shanks or without changing the relation between the action and the keyboard, which causes uh, huge, huge problems, which are, I think, very renowned in US more than in, in Europe, uh, because a big manufacturer uh, did it another way for a long time and uh, messed up a lot of things with that. Yeah. Um, the adoption up and down is also very necessary because the string height um, in most older instrument varies from, uh, from uh, instrument to instrument within the same model. That is just because of natural uh, differences in building the soundboard, building the bridges, positioning the iron frame, differences in the frame, all this lead at the end to some differences in, uh, in the inner height of the piano. And uh, we can do this um, in, in different ways. Uh, one possible thing is um, if, the, uh, if the height in, in the cabinet uh, is higher, we just change the, the ball length of the hammers. Or if it is lower, we can uh, also go with the ball length down. It is just um, causing some trouble with the back checking and maybe with space in the action. Uh, but in general, that is uh, possible. But the thing why this is often not done is that the change of the ball length will have an effect on the strike. Uh, the, the hammer strike is a little different 
if the bore length is varied. And uh, this makes some manufacturers say that they want to stay with the bore length and rather uh, correct the action on the keyboard up and down. And um, the correction on the keyboard will, uh, as you correct the capstan height, will only have a small uh, effect on the, um, on the back length of the, on the real back length of the, of the keyboard and a little on the magic line, but, but the influence is quite small. And so a change within one, two millimeters up and down is acceptable and, and done with a lot of pianos. Um, other brands like, like Bechstein, uh, they had uh, each hammer set individually drilled to the instrument. And so it is uh, rather a problem if you order a Bechstein hammer set that is drilled to a certain middle um, level that it uh, maybe is not perfectly fitting your, your piano. And um, the best way to cure this, uh, especially by today's possibilities we have, is just to correct the inner height of the piano by correcting the height of the cabinet before you attach the, um, the um, how is it called, uh, the platform where the action is positioned. Keybed. Yeah, the keybed. Yeah, before the, you, you place and install the keybed, you can um, correct the uh, height of the cabinet. Uh, so the inner height is always exactly the same. Today, that is no more a big problem. In, in former times uh, for old piano makers, is, this has uh, rather been a, a bigger problem. So uh, they decided to do other things. <clears throat> yeah, so far to the uh, action position. And, uh, and that is uh, what, what um, is very often for the rebuilders a big trouble uh, to get the incorrect positioning of the action managed afterwards as the action is not playing very good and um, the, um, the relations in the action are destroyed by incorrect uh, assembling the action. And um, as Michael said before, um, the idea that everything is made perfect by the manufacturer is, uh, is more wishful thinking than real um, reality. Yeah, um, what is done in, in many pianos and uh, what has a reason is the enhancement by tension. Um, we had already seen a lot of things where to, to make a piano a soundboard uh, where we are talking about the importance of the tension in the system. And we have already um, seen that the speed of sound, so the travel speed through the material in the inner of the wood is increasing when we are tensioning the wood. When we set the wood under stress, the... Um, um, the speed of the traveling sound in the material is rising. And um, this is a, a very in, important fact as um, this, this elevation of speed of sound has a second uh, nice side effect. If the speed of sound is higher, in, in the material, the loss of energy is lower. That is the same as we transform uh, electric power to a very, very high voltage to transport it over a long distance, as this creates less loss of energy in the wire. That is the only reason why we send the electric power uh, to, to long distances in a, in a high voltage and not in the voltage we need in, in the, where we use it. And um, there, is a, uh, there is a yeah, certain way 
uh, how we can put uh, the highest stress and and um, tension into the piano. We have the keyboard, the belly, the soundboard, the bridge, and our back post. And we have our iron frame above this. And then we have a string going over the bridge, but the string position is lower than the center of the uh, frame struts. The string is pressing on the soundboard and pressing out the belly and the back post also set under tension from maybe bridge co uh, connectors to the iron frame or things, pressing to the front. And the iron frame is bending. In the start, we talked about uh, the change of, um, of structure of the iron frame. And I, I said it is uh, more uh, vivid and um, you can, uh, there's more flex in than we imagine. And really the iron frame is bending through the tension of the strings. And as the, the struts are bending upwards, this nose bolt is bending forwards to in direction of the belly. And if we place a shoe, a big massive shoe and a bolt here, and we connect it, we can direct those tension from one side to the other and avoid that the both the, the parts are bending too much. We catch the bending of this and the pushing of that, and we counterbalance it uh, by connecting it. And this is also a possibility, what we talked before, if the belly is deforming uh, due to the pressure of the soundboard, that is a really a big problem as if the, the belly only bends away for, for some tens of, of uh, some millimeters, um, it, is, it is really a bad effect on the, on the sound of the soundboard, as, which result from the deformation of the soundboard. And this is also a way to, to drag back the belly and to avoid that the belly, which is under stress from the pressing soundboard, is bending forward. And this is very, very important. And here's this unknown piano, um, which, which uses this structure and has all the large beams connected here in the iron shoe and connected to the uh, string with this a bolt on the nose. And maybe you have a de-strung a piano like this and you find the wedge is, uh, which is between the, um, with, which be between the nose bolt and the collector. And um, you find if you took away the strings, the wedge is just dropping out. And if you place it again, into the space where it belongs and you start to restring the piano and you just have an area of, of 20 strings or uh, 20 notes of strings on it, you can no more remove this wedge. As you can see how, how strong the pressure on this uh, wedge is already. And that shows how, how strong this pressure is. At Zyla, we used a, a similar uh, system, but we did not use a wedge. We used uh, a screw. And this big uh, screw bolt had, um, had numbers um, in the head of the screw bolt. And once we had to, to take the, the plate off again from an instrument that was strung, and we, we had to take down the strings again and took off the, uh, the, the plate, and this crew lost the numbers. They were, they were numbers 
um, stamped into the head and you could see the shades of these numbers, but they were absolutely flat. You can see how much this, this power is in this system. Yeah. We had a question here when you, when you have a minute. Yeah. Um, and this is going uh, to uh, restoring action stacks in Steinways. Mark Campbell says he, uh, that's what he, he does, restore some action stacks in Steinways. Um, he sets the spread distance to a consistent value, such as 11, uh, 112.5 millimeters. If this best, is this the best practice to get a consistent internal geometry or should uh, or would you be looking at this differently? Uh, I would say that the, the, spread diff, uh, the spread distance, if I um, see it from the right point, he has meant it, is um, the point between the um, uh, center of the weapon and the center of the hammer. And uh, this is, uh, at my point of view, rather um, the, um, the dimension which is based on the knuckle um, distance from the center. Um, it is, uh, if you have a 70 millimeter um, distance from the center to the knuckle, uh, the spread is a little different than if you have a 50 or 60 millimeter um, distance of the roll from the, uh, from the center. And this spread, is, is uh, very important for the inner geometry of the action. But the main thing I was uh, talking about is if is a whole action stack is replaced on the keyboard and so uh, the rear lever of the keyboard is um, mistreated. <laughs> and so you have a different um, um, length in the, where the capstan attaches under the uh, the action and the um, the geometry of the action is ruined by the wrong place the capstan contacts the action it was not my my things were not uh, looking at the inner um, geometry of the of the action itself but of course this is correct uh, it has to be uh, taken to to um, to a, to a very consistent um, thing, but I think it depends on the on the age of the piano and, and of the of the uh, position of the weapons in the action, which might be different. Yeah, and he confirmed that the you're talking about the same definition of spread. Okay. So thank you for that. Yeah, if we have this picture of the of the piano. I want to, to maybe to talk about uh, some rumors about some elements in, uh, in this uh, piano. Uh, the first and big thing is this, I don't know how it's called in English, in, in German it's called the Glocke. Uh, bell, this, yeah. Yeah? Bell, yeah, same, same word. The bell, the bell, okay, yeah. Um, the, the reason why they put this uh, glocke here is mainly if you put a, um, a, a wooden beam here, it doesn't help so much because in this area, there is no compression on this. Uh, if, you, if you put a, a wooden beam here, there is no compression on the wooden beam. Uh, in this area, there's rather stretch in the structure of the piano. So it is rather torn outside and that is not very, um, not too um, helpful if you have a wooden, wooden beam there. It, it, uh, of course it can manage that, but uh, the, the stress factor is not what the wooden beam can control best. So they keep away this wooden beam and just they need a connection, they need um, a connection screw between the iron frame and um, uh, to keep the iron frame from lifting up. Because in the travel area, there are many, many strings in a very short area that 
are running over the bridge. And as they are rising on the way to the bridge, they lift up the iron frame. And this is, has a strong effect on the down bearing and on the pressure of the strings on the bridge that would be reduced if you just let the iron frame go up. And that's the reason why you put the screw there, which normally goes into the um, uh, wooden um, beam of the strong bag, but there is no beam. So they put in the bell and connect this uh, uh, screw to the bell. And the second effect is that the bend soundboard, which is pressed down, uh, flattens the um, support of the soundboard and the, the rim is pressed out by this pressing of the soundboard, the strong pressure of the soundboard on the rim support. And to avoid the rim bending outwards, the uh, bell also helps because it is uh, lifting and and taking, uh, tangening the rim to the inside. It gives at one hand, it, it increases the tension on the rim. At the other hand, it avoids that the rim is bended outside by the pressure of the soundboard. And that's the main reason why this um, structure with a, with a bell is helping there and um, and a, um, a wooden um, beam would not be um, more efficient at this area. The thing that I already mentioned is that there is stress on the on the system that the soundboard uh, and the rim is rather stretched out here from the um, from the belly rail and the belly is pressed to the inside. And this is the function of this small, um, small wooden rail. This small wooden rail is, is heavily attached to the big um, beam here. And it is very securely attached inside the belly under the soundboard support. And um, most, um, most materials can deal with a lot of stress and can handle a lot of stress. And so this small wooden um, piece can carry a lot of stress and help the belly not to deform to the front so that the belly is not going away at this crucial area we talked about, which is the the main part where the melody takes part and the weakest part of the piano. And this helps to support the belly not to bend at this area. And these are the two magic and mystic things here. They're just technical elements. Yeah. Okay, no questions, good. <laughs> Yeah, and here we are again at the field. Uh, how can we um, how can we um, enhance um, put enhancements uh, by repair into the instruments? And uh, one important thing is that um, front or rear duplex scales, and they are. Um, very often something like a front or rear duplex is existing um, or even possible uh, or, or at least possible, but there's only a felt uh, put in there. And, um, and sometimes it, it can be possible to just put the felt away and put um, um, a, bra a piece of brass there to, to um, put the string on a hard support instead of a, of a soft felt. But we have to be a little careful because if we do that in the front area where the, where the pins are, 
um, this area is varying very much from the length and we cannot really control the frequency in it. And so sometimes it is better, better to, to leave the, um, the part um, behind the front duplex to the strings. Yeah, um, the secrets about the duplex scale. I have uh, seen a lot of, of uh, things written about the duplex scale, but uh, mostly they only describe how it is done. Uh, but uh, I have not really uh, read a lot about uh, how it really works, what is really the effect. And um, so I, I uh, was trying to put a lot of things together to completely discover or, well, to mention some facts <laughs> of uh, the function of the duplex scale. We start with the rear duplex. Um, as soon as a bridge starts to move the back length of the string, is of course forced into movement two. And if the back end of the string is buried on a felt, this energy given by the bridge into the rear length of the string is just eliminated. And a lot of energy is being lost. If the string is laid on a hard support, the the frequency and the wave is reflected and the energy is not absorbed, but the energy is kept in the system. We will see a little later if this always is, pos uh, is positive. <laughs> um, the sound potential is supported in different ways. Um, if the rear length is synchronized to a partial or to the frequency of the main uh, of the speaking length, the scale will boost the sound of the string. The intensification of the sound is only for a very small part uh, based on the sound which is directly emitted by the real duplex. The real duplex is more important for the keeping the energy in the system and they spread out uh, high, um, high partials which are very important uh, for the perceptibility and the recognition uh, from the recognition of the sound from uh, maybe in a large orchestra. The recognition of sound, uh, we probably all know about the importance of the four kilohertz band, the frequency around 4,000 hertz. This frequency area is area is crucial for the identification of a sound. It makes the characteristics of a sound um, recognizable. Difficult word. <laughs> um, hey, you spoken, have to have a little empathy for me now. <laughs> I have. I'm pronouncing the German roots. <laughs> I have. <laughs> In spoken language, it carries um, the, the S and F sounds. Uh, so we can um, uh, see the difference between uh, or hear the difference. If the four kilohertz band is damaged in our ears, and that is very often um, uh, the first thing that happens if, you're, if your ears is weakening, are weakening, uh, we still seem to hear quite well as all the important of the sound is much below this four kilohertz band. Uh, we can still talk and listen very well as long as it is quiet around. Uh, but as soon as, as we are faced to disturbing effects as many 
people talking at once or um, noises are around like street noises or others, the problem becomes visible. It becomes difficult to separate a single voice from the noise or in a group. And this is mainly because of this four kilohertz band. The emittance of the duplex uh, scale um, helps for the same reason. In the orchestra, which is also, also produces a, a lot of noise, yeah, it helps to identify different instruments. Um, if the four a kilohertz band is damaged. We hear a perfect fusion, but we can no more uh, hear the, uh, the details. And the four kilohertz band carries the frequencies of most important par partials from the second octave on and above. And um, even at the um, a44, the ninth partial uh, sounds very much, uh, is already in the, in the four kilohertz uh, range. Um, but we also have to remember that the uh, duplex scale itself also has, um, uh, has partials. So the duplex is, is mainly important for this support of this four kilohertz band um, that uh, helps us to identify the sound. Um, tuning the real the rear duplex. Um, if the frequency is adapted, we hear an enhancement in the sound. The return of the energy into the speaking length is very important for the length of the tone. And uh, the length of the tone is what we try to get as one of the most important things when we try to voice. Leo, if um, I may uh, jump in here real quickly, I'd like to share a, a quick an anecdotal story about uh, duplex scaling. Uh, here in the US, there's uh, lots of uh, philosophies, uh, some controversies about duplex scales versus mm -hmm. non-duplex scales. Uh, for, for a brief period of time, I, I worked with uh, Rick Baldison up in Salt Lake City, and Rick was a Mason and Hamlin dealer. And Rick had asked me to uh, voice uh, a Mason and Hamlin grand for a client that was coming in. Uh, the piano sounded a little bit dull and it, it lacked duration, especially in the treble. So um, evaluating the instrument and to make this story short, what ended up being the, uh, the solution to, to this, this issue was that the duplex scale, which was there and was active, it was not tuned. So I spent an hour or so and tuned the duplex and retuned the piano. And it, it's kind of then that I realized how critical uh, the duplex scaling is because in, in just tuning this duplex scale, it was like a different piano. And I did nothing to the hammers. Uh, mm -hmm. All I did was I tuned the duplex scale and tuned the piano and listened to it again. And all of a sudden the, the entire treble area just came alive. So, yeah, absolutely. And um, a, a thing that is very often also done is that we um, tune, tune the duplex rather sharp uh, than, than just really uh, fitting, we, we tune it uh, quite sharp. And um, there are, there are two, two reasons to do that. Um, if the 
if the string starts to vibrate, the oscillation runs to the bridge and is reflected there, and the part runs over the bridge into the rear duplex. And uh, it has to cross the bridge by doing that. And the biggest part is reflected, while the smart, the smaller part crosses the bridge into the rear duplex and is reflected at the end of the support of the duplex. Uh, if the frequency in the string and in the duplex are the same, both return to the bridge and meet there. But as the sound uh, or, or the frequency that had to cross the, the bridge, this takes a time and this creates a delay. So from the duplex, which started later to vibrate, it returns. So frequency also returns a little later to the bridge. And this is one reason why we, um, we tune the duplex a little sharper so that the faster returning sharper frequency uh, is at the same time at the bridge and the enhancement of the sound is better. Uh, I had at this uh, situation sometimes that people say uh, the bridge is a very strong connector and there is no delay between that. But that is not true because um, the sound always travels with a certain speed through the material and he has to, to cross a distance. And so it is always um, a delay there. Uh, yeah, if you, if you look at this uh, very correctly, you may see that if we tune the duplex sharp and um, the, the, the tone is going on, this will, um, this will affect um, a phase shift in, as in the ongoing, there will be a phase shift. And so you will create a, a wrong beat or a wrong um, a phase into the string. And that's absolutely correct. And this um, effect has, a, a, for a part, a negative effect on that uh, and which will, um, in the, the main um, term of it, it will make the, the tuning of the piano a little more difficult because uh, the noises and the effects on the duplex have uh, not the effect that the tone is is always growing more more calm and quiet it has more side effects but um yeah we have we have to go there um that is the point where i where i like to to stress out that uh we are the servants of the piano and of the sound and of the pianists and of the audience and uh not um, uh, the piano is not make, made to please us. It is made to do, give the best tone and to please the pianist and the audience. And yeah, we have to deal with it. <laughs> it's just the way it is. And we have to take care of, to take out uh, the best we can get. And um, if we learn to deal with the noises of the duplex scala. I think after a time you learn to take advantage of it, you will hear differences in the tone and you will easier be able to decide if you have to stretch a little more or less, uh, if you're oral tuning and uh, to, to bring the piano to a, to a very good uh, um, level. And um, yeah, but it's really not easier to tune a piano with that. A very, very important thing in the, in the piano uh, is to understand what is the damping factor. Um, 
we know that damping takes part, but if we look at the uh, physical details of this, uh, it is very important to know that the damping factor within a material is always a partial absorbing of energy of the single wave. The damping factor or the percentage loss um, is going on every single vibration is diminished. So every turn through a wave is going to be a little smaller than the one before. And um, in physics, uh, the damping factor is uh, defined as this diminution of each uh, single wave in the piano. And this means that a higher tone suffers from uh, a doubled amount of damping just because its frequency is higher if it has more waves at the same time, the diminishing factor is doubled by doubling the frequency. And this is just the physical reality. And this shows us why we have so much trouble in the travel. <laughs> um, if we have uh, the C3 in relation to the C8, the, the factor of this higher diminishing of the, of the volume is 32 by one. So in which piano do we have 30, uh, 32 seconds of sound on the C3? That would be nice. And, um, but uh, that would mean that we have one second at the C8 and that's not really a lot. So that leads us to the situation that we have to fight a lot against this damping and that we have to fight a lot more against damping in the travel area than in the other area. In the base with a low, uh, with a low damping effect, um, the damping is not a big thing if we, if we don't waste everything. In the middle, it comes to be interesting, but in the treble, it is really crucial. If we look at the, um, mm, I want to make clear uh, how, how strong the effect is of all that and how important that is. And so uh, I wanted to, to make this small calculation. If uh, A4, lasts for 20 seconds, it makes 20 times 440 hertz, which means it makes in this 20 seconds, 8,800 vibrations. If the damping factor, the, the damping factor is one by 8,800. So if the hitch pin moves for a thousandth of a millimeter, with why because it is it has a flex or something we increase the damping factor by this about two percent and two percent of this damping factor so the damping is this and we result in a in a um we result in a, a tone length of 19.6 seconds so we last 0 0.4 seconds uh, with only a thousands of flex in the um, in the hitch pin. This calculation is not correct, and um, there are many other facts. And yeah, but it pictures how serious we have to take this. And if we if we take um, at the C seven, the damping factor is eight times as strong. And so it would create a loss of 3.2 seconds of sound. And this makes clear how important it is 
to have the view at the smallest amounts of energy we waste, especially in the travel. I'll just interject here real quick. Um, we're, we're a little bit over the hour and <clears throat> I'm happy to continue as long as we like, but just wanted to, uh, you know, point that out for everybody's sake. Um, um, happy that you you guys are excited to keep going you're like machines here <laughs> so um yeah it i'm having a great time and learning a lot of interesting things as well um uh and so i just want to make sure that it's up to you you folks at this point you know michael and and leo you know i'm happy to continue as long as you like but also want to be respectful of your time so so you just kind of let us know how you'd like to proceed in terms of the rest of the presentation of course, I think I think we're pretty close. Uh, we're pretty close to to summary. So why why don't we go ahead and can, continue? Are you okay with that, Leo? Of course. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe I take it a little faster. Um, however, a duplex is made. Uh, if you have no duplex in a piano, you accept to lose a part of the energy that is uh, produced by the uh, movement of the rear area of the string, uh, that this is lost. And um, uh, the, um, the sound emitted by the rear duplex is very, very small and not really the big effect. The keeping of the energy is the most important thing. That is a little different uh, if we look at the front duplex. Um, to, to understand how the, the uh, front duplex works, uh, we make a small excurse. Um, the vibration of the string consists of two major components, the transversal wave and the longitudinal wave. Um, the transversal wave, um, moves perpendicular to the string. That is what we all know. The longitudinal wave is moving along the string within the material. It consists of compression and stretching of the material itself. The most important is that a longitudinal wave is invisible and inaudible. And it, uh, only its effects can become visible and audible. The wave itself is not. And every mechanical wave has transversal and longitudinal components. Um, yeah, transversal is very common. We feel it, we hear it, we know it. <laughs> the behavior is uh, just um, at the moment of attack, so, um, the string starts to vibrate. And uh, we also know that um, it is not only going up and down, but it starts to, to turn and to go sideways and upwards again. And it's, it's um, going to this. Uh, you could think that this comes from the inconsistence of the material, but this is not, not true. This only gives a very small part of it. Uh, this effect of, of uh, turning and changing orientation is also found in an ideal system. Um, sound. Yeah, uh, so if these effects um, take part that the, um, that the string is changing the orientation, uh, this, you could imagine that if you have three strings and they are moving uh, chaotic, um, then you will have eliminations in sound and um, very weird and strange effects. And... Um, this is only taking part for a very small um, part uh, as the strings are coupled together by the connection on the bridge, which is also moving. And this is um, synchronizing the movement of the strings. And that's why there is no total chaos. 
um, to understand what this um, what this um, um, synchronization of the coupled uh, pen uh, pendulum means is it is it clear to all is that what a coupled pendulum is yes mm -hmm. okay so we skip that um, the longitudinal wave uh, demands uh, a lot of imagination to us uh, the problem is we can see them we normally cannot feel them and they are inaudible and uh, inaudible, yeah. Um, why is it inaudible? A wave is only audible if it emits energy directly into the air. And the air takes it to our ears. A transversal wave uh, does this uh, even if the amount of energy transferred directly into the air and not through the sound board is very small, but we even can hear um, a string that is only vibrating without any um, uh, amplification, like in an electric guitar that is not plugged in. We can hear the strings. It's not loud, but it's, it's, it's visible, uh, audible. <laughs> Um, but a longitudinal wave is not sentenced to remain longitudinal forever. The same chaotic behavior that uh, leads to the uh, phase shift, uh, it's a transversal um, waves, creates um, transversal ex extensions from the longitudinal wave out of itself. And uh, more important is that the, um, that, the, um, that it can transfer uh, transform into a transversal wave. So um, because the thing is, if this longitudinal wave tears and drags and uh, at the bridge, it takes the bridge into movement, and this movement is transversal, and this is audible. It makes the soundboard vibrate and give sound. And so the energy from the longitudinal inaudible wave is transferred into the soundboard and creates a audible sound. This is a very important. Um, and what we, uh, why this is so important is that the longitudinal wave, which is in the string with all its, its uh, compression and, and stretch, uh, transport a huge amount of energy. And this is hidden to us. We don't see it. And, um, and most of the models of sound and things is not using this. It's only working with the transversal waves because it is just enough to explain it. And there are only few uh, phenomena which can only be explained by the um, longitudinal wave. And one of it is the function of the front duplex. Um, the interesting thing is that we have an angle here at the front duplex. And this, is, um, this needs to be more than 40 degree. Before it has 40 degree, we will not see an effect like this. And if the energy, the longitudinal energy is running through the string to the capodasta and, um, and runs over the V-bar, hmm, It deforms the string behind the V-bar, which is here in an angle. The reason is the energy inside the longitudinal wave is an impulse. And this impulse is 
at one hand bound to the string, but the, at the other hand, it is directed. It is running in this direction. And when it crosses the V bar, the direction is changed. And so there is a force necessary to change the direction of this impulse. And this force is created by the um, deforming string, which the string is deformed by the energy of the impulse that wants to carry on going straight on. And then the string uh, pushes the, um, this impulse to a new direction, but at the same time, the string is taking to a transversal movement. So the longitudinal impulse coming from the main string, from the uh, speaking length, is turning into a transversal movement of the front duplex by crossing the V-bar. And, um, and, and, and this has a lot of impulse and a lot of force. And the noise coming from the front duplex is immense and is very much uh, taking um, loud high partials uh, that are very, very audible and uh, take a lot of, of uh, sound in addition to the speaking lengths. And, and here the, the front duplex is different than the rear duplex. It really creates tones. If the front duplex is too long, it happens that the sound created in the uh, front duplex is um, you hear it as a, as a uh, not as an enhancement of the sound of the speaking length, but it, it uh, listens like a, a separate frequency. And this is a problem as you don't want to have a second tone there, you want to have an enhancement to the main sound. And that is very, very important. And um, the second effect, uh, if this uh, longitudinal wave turns into a transversal, the transversal is easier reflected at the next support where it is based on and is kept in the system. A transversal uh, uh, wave is easier to be reflected than a longitudinal. A longitudinal always tends to go ahead. If we look back at the rear duplex again, of course, also there, the longitudinal ways is hitting across the, the bridge into the rear duplex. And if you see that there is not a big angle, only the little delay from the, um, from the bridge pins, the amount of energy passing over the bridge into the hitch length of the string is very high. And if we give, if we abandon this, we, we give away a lot of energy uh, that, that we, we lose, yeah. Noises from the front duplex. The most of the noises occur if the angle is too flat. And uh, 14 degree is not the angle that we should have. 14 degree, as I mentioned, is the minimum angle we need to take this into function. Um, if we, uh, I think the ideal uh, angle is probably about 18 degree because between 14 and 16 degree, the front duplex uh, produces a lot of noise. And at 80 degree, it is normally not noisy. If it becomes more than 20, 21 degree, uh, it will become very difficult to tune because uh, the string is too much clamped between uh, in, the, in this angle and not, um, and not willing to move uh, across this. And so the instrument is difficult to tune. Yeah, yeah. Um, in in 